Well, this is it, my friends. Chapter 16, the last chapter in, that we're going to cover uh, in the book. And by the way, speaking of which, I skipped a couple of really neat chapters here. Uh, you got to pick and choose what you're going to cover. Um, chapter 13, dummy dependent variable techniques, where your dependent variable is like a one or a zero. With those, you can do things like estimate the likelihood that somebody's going to default on their loan or something like this. So you end up as your uh, uh, regression parameters, you plug those in there. Uh, and uh, I mean, that's how they figure out when they ask you all those questions when, before they let you buy a house, is they ran a regression at some point. And like, okay, if you're married, then on that variable, then, then you know, this coefficient and so forth, and you end up with a number at the other end with a percentage likelihood. Anyway, there's some neat stuff in there. I've, I've done one of those studies, but it was a long time ago, and I can't remember uh, now offhand how I did it. The dog is in here with me right now. We may well uh, experience the dog barking like crazy because someone's coming to the house in moments uh, to talk, uh, give us an estimate on painting the house. So anyway, I'm going to do my best. Uh, but uh, I'm keeping him in here so it doesn't bother uh, Melanie and the painter person. Now, chapter 16. As I said at the end of the last video, um, this is experimental and panel data. And uh, I don't really do stuff with this. But I know there are a couple of faculty in our department that do, so I thought you might find it kind of useful, uh, and it would be useful for them if I went over this, if they had students coming into their class that already had some familiarity with these techniques. Uh, and it's really interesting. Now, uh, they're not terribly com complicated. Random assignment experiments. All right, you already know what these are. Uh, you hear about that when they have a new drug coming out, hopefully one for COVID-19, uh, and they, they, they choose the, the group of people, uh, and then like half of them they actually give the treatment to, and half of them they give a placebo. Uh, and then the point is to see what difference there was in the uh, health of those individuals after the you know, study period is over, all right? So that's probably pretty familiar to you. And this is the way, well, I think I'll write it here. I was going to just show it to you, but I think I'll write it over here. Outcome equals beta sub 0 plus beta sub 1 treatment plus a random error, yeah, plus the stochastic error term. Yeah. I, I, I. Okay. Uh, where desired outcome and uh, let's see one if in treatment group. All right, so the treatment thing is a dummy variable. Uh, and let's say we're calculating here um, whether or not somebody survives uh, uh, COVID-19, all right? And uh, in which case you would have a dummy dependent variable, which I just mentioned a minute ago would be a one or a zero, but, but uh, don't uh, worry too much about that. But that's, we're trying to figure out uh, the health of an individual. Hey, let's make it simpler. Let's say that this is a situation where we're trying to figure out how to lower people's temperatures when they're sick, all right? So you got a temperature of 102, you know, and so independent of the disease, you still want to be able to lower the temperature. And so what we've done is we've come up with this new technique of trying to lower people's temperatures. And uh, half of them are going to use this new technique. Half of them were not going to use this new technique. So this outcome here is going to be their temperature after uh, we have done this treatment, the, the temperature after we have carried this out. Again, for half of them, we haven't done anything. And so what we're really after here is to see the difference between those who got the new treatment and those who didn't. So for every observation, and, and notice here we're not putting in any explanatory variables other than just, did you get the treatment or not? Because what we're hoping is, is that we got a large enough sample size to where anything that would have been different from one group to the next is, is swamped out. We, we have a, no, let's put, yeah, he wants out now. Um, come here, come, come, come. Anything, if we have a large enough sample size, then uh, theoretically, come. Um, anybody that, any individual differences from the two groups, uh, are not consistent. We have a pretty random group of people over here that are getting the treatment and a pretty random group of people over here. And so there's no individual characteristics that the people have here that are different from one group to the next. 
the average uh, um, you know, age, the average gender, the average income over here is the same as this over here. If we don't have that, we've got a problem, and, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But what we're hoping for is that everything about these two people that's relevant to our study is the same in these two groups, except we gave these people the new treatment and these people not. So all we've got to include is just this variable right here. And uh, it's a one if you're in the treatment group and a zero if not. If we're trying to reduce people's temperatures, of course, we're gonna hope this is gonna be negative and significant. That hopefully in the treatment group, if you were in the treatment group, it actually lowered your temperature um, and uh, by, a significant, uh, by a statistically significant amount. Come. Now, see, uh, come, come, come. I gave him something to chew on. I was hoping I was gonna shut him up. Come here, buddy. Yeah, he wants out of this room really badly. All right, uh, so this beta sub one here is called the differences estimator. And you can see, I think you can see uh, with that simple example of how this would work. Now, that said, you know, I said that uh, we want to make a sample size to where we've got, you know, the average person over here is exactly the same as the average person over here. Well, what if we can't do that, all right? Uh, in that case, then, we do need, you know, if, we, if we're worried that, well, let's also include, you know, plus beta sub 2 age, plus beta sub, uh, sub 3 uh, I don't know, uh, inoculation over some disease or something like that. Uh, so by um, you can include those variables that you believe are relevant. And in fact, Studeman recommends that you do do that because you can't guarantee that you got everything exactly average between these two groups over here. Um, so uh, for that reason, then uh, you'd want to make sure that you did include some other variables, even though statistically speaking, ha 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 even though, strictly speaking, you don't have to, all right? Um, so, then, uh, let's see what else does he say here. Ah, all right, well, this sounds great, doesn't it? It sounds like a really neat way to do some research. Uh, we could do a job training program, I believe, is one of the examples he uses in the book uh, for some people, and then other people not give the job training program, um, and uh, then see what the difference is in their uh, salaries, you know, uh, a year from now or whatever. Um, but the problem is, that we can't really do what, what, what they can do in medical science, and that is uh, make sure that everyone gets this treatment over here and the folks over here don't get it. Um, the samples are usually uh, not random. They're, they're, and when we do these things in economics, we typically do it on campus. Like, you know, like in the psychology department where they have those sign-up sheets outside for students to sign up to do different experiments and stuff? Well, they're required to for their... For their uh, um, psychology class so they get lots of subjects but of course their subjects range from like 18 to 22 years of age and with a certain socioeconomic background um, and so that's awful narrow all right well we got the same problem in economics we usually pay people if we're going to do one of these experiments like this and and quite honestly it's really hard to uh, come up with many things we can this is done all right the, we, economists do uh, do these experiments just like you have in psychology but it's awful hard to come up with much that's terribly significant uh, that you can do. So, um, unfortunately, we can't do that very often. What we can hope for, however, are natural experiments. Situations where, again, it's, it's rare, uh, but where in the real world, there ended up being two groups that were virtually identical except for one thing, all right? Uh, and there was a, a classic example of this I, it was New Jersey, and I can't remember where else. But uh, these two states were next to each other. They, had, they you know, had, had a lot of similarities. And one of them increased their minimum wage law, and one didn't. And the question was, does increasing the minimum wage law, uh, increasing the minimum wage, I should say, not the minimum wage law, uh, does it reduce employment? And so one group had a new minimum wage law. The other group didn't. You've got unemployment rate on the far left over there, uh, and you test it that way. So if you're lucky, you can come up with a situation like that. Um, and by the way, the, the, the conclusion was uh, that it didn't impact it, right? So that was considered kind of a classic uh, study there because it did something different than folks had done before. All right, trying to keep him quiet. It's going to be a problem when somebody rings the doorbell. Uh, let's see here. Okay, yeah, I already told, oh, 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 yeah, 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 that's right, that's right, I have to tell you that too. Now, however, when we do the natural experiment stuff, we usually uh, compare the changes in the outcomes 
rather than just the outcome. Now, what I did here was I was looking at just the outcome. <clears throat> what was the patient's temperature at the end of this uh, test period? Now, we're going to look at how their temperature changed from start to end, all right? And, and why would we do that? Um, well, the reason is, uh, with, with this situation right here where we have much more control over the experiment, we can just pick people out who have the same temperature to start with, all right? Whereas in these natural experiments, there's gonna be a lot more problems, right? So, so uh, for example, let's say it was New Jersey and New York in this, in this study. Um, Probably New Jersey and New York didn't start with the same unemployment rates to begin with, all right? So, it's, so knowing what their unemployment rates were at the end isn't nearly as helpful as knowing how much their unemployment rates changed by the end. And let me put that over here and let's see if I can write this left-handed uh, with the dog right here. All right, delta. So what we do instead there is a delta outcome. We do the change in the unemployment rate in New Jersey from when they didn't have the minimum wage law to when they did, and the change in New York from where they didn't have the unemployment, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, minimum wage law, and they did, but of course they never had, they, they never changed it in New York, so they're, they're the, um, uh, they're the ones that are going to be, uh, oh gosh, now I've forgotten the name. Hello. Control group, all right? So New York's the control group because they changed the minimum wage law in New Jersey. They didn't in New York. Because they might not have started at the same point, we're gonna look at not the unemployment rates in the two states after the minimum wage law was passed, but the change from before it was enacted to after it was enacted. And then we're checking to see, of course, one is gonna be for New Jersey, and we're checking it to see whether or not there's a statistically significant impact. And in this case, it'd be one of the few cases where you wouldn't hypothesize a sign yet. You're like, I don't know. Increase in the minimum wage uh, could lower, could raise unemployment because it, the cost of labor goes up, or it could lower unemployment because people who earn minimum wage tend to spend all their incomes, a very high propensity to consume, and so this means that they have more money to spend. So uh, it could actually raise employment. And again, their, their, their result was it didn't do anything. Uh, there's a good example in the book, which I'll mention here real quickly, uh, but you can read over. And that is, uh, I was just telling Melanie about this, um, that they did one on, uh, we want to look at, uh, let's see, this was, this was Arco, whoever that is, some, some uh, oil company. They were acquiring Thrifty Oil Company. So they were buying up another oil company. Well, the, the, the question was, is this going to destroy competition? All right, because we're, we're concentrating. And so what they did was they divided the gas stations up, the uh, Arco gas stations. They looked at the Arco gas stations that were in direct competition with a thrifty gas station. There's the doorbell. And then, a, uh, th then they looked at the uh, Arco gas stations that were not within one mile of a thrifty gas station. Listen, do you want to be a control group or a treatment group of your own? What happens to the dog after we throw him on the floor? Shh, oh, oh, oh. Speaking of control, shh, yeah, that's right, I'm gonna squirt you. All right, so once again, what they decided to do in terms of a treatment and control group was, their control group were Arco gas stations that were never in competition with a thrifty gas station. And their treatment group was the ones that were, were in competition, all right? So what they're trying to figure out is, once they uh, merged, did their, gap, did their prices go up, all right? Once they merged, their prices go up. Um, and so they uh, tested this, and you know, obviously the control group's prices are gonna go up or down, whatever, uh, for reasons other than the merger. But so, so, okay, fair enough, the prices are going to move, but did the uh, treatment group, did the group that was in direct competition, did their behavior differ before the merger and after the merger? And the answer is yes. It turns out that before the merger, the Arco gas stations uh, that were in direct competition, their prices were three cents per gallon cheaper than average because they were in comp direct competition after the merger they were not just average, they were three cents above the average. So indeed, that's exactly what they did. I mean, you know, anyone taking an intro micro class could tell you, yeah, when they merge, the prices are gonna go up because there's less competition. But it was an interesting way to do it. They compared the change in prices if you were in competition versus if you were not in competition. Um, and so that's the last thing about that. Okay, yeah, that is. That's the last thing on the experimental 
uh, methods. Now panel data. And uh, boy, with the kind of data we can get nowadays uh, with um, you know, these huge data sets, uh, this has become a big deal. Panel data, or longitudinal data, uh, includes observations of the same variables from the same cross-section for two or more time periods. Okay, let me explain what I mean by that. Um, let's say you did, uh, there's, there's something called a pooled uh, regression, and that combines time series and cross-section. For example, let's say you did a study on uh, the effect of the hours of study on grade for every intro econ, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, I guess intro uh, micro econ class at TCU in fall 2020, uh, in spring 2021, you know, and so on. You did several different semesters, right? So you've got, that, that increases your, your um, sample size, which is really handy. Not only are you looking across time at the grades, you're also looking at like 10 different sections at the same time. So you've got 10 observations per year, uh, and then you've got, you know, say five years of data, which is gonna be 10 times that because you've got uh, two semesters. So, but that's not panel or longitudinal because it's not the same students, right? What, what, what this panel or longitudinal data represents is you're looking at the exact same students over time, all right? So you can see that this will be something where you get a, a very different set of information. And uh, yeah, it's not the same students, so it then it's pooled. All right. Now, there are four different kinds of variables in panel data. And uh, let me write these up here on the board. I'm going to have to let the dog go. Uh, let's see what, how this works out. Go. Hey, ding dong. Yeah, that's right. I got the water sprayer right here. All right. Uh, let's see. Let me erase this. I brought him in a, a treat here, but he couldn't care less about that right now. He wants to go uh, meet the person who is giving us an estimate on painting the house. Um, and hey, who can blame him? All right, so in panel data, you end up with four different kinds of variables. One, those that differ between individuals, but not over time. Uh-huh, no, that's right, differ between in die vid you owls, but not over time. For example, uh, your uh, ethnicity, if we include that as one of the independent variables, is not going to change over time. Uh, your where you went to high school uh, is not going to change over time for you, all right, for the individual. It's going to be different from student to student, but it's not going to change for you as we look at different time, time periods. Then there are going to be some that are going to change over time. I did a little warning squirt there. Um, cha change over time. He'll shake like that even if you threaten to squirt him because he feels like he got squirted. Uh, change over time. but are the same for all individuals at the same time. But same for all individuals at same time. Uh, who the president is is going to change over time, but it's going to be the same for everybody. Uh, the current national unemployment rate is going to change over time, but it's going to be the same for everybody. Then there are going to be some, they're going to vary by time and individual. Vary by time and individual. Marital status uh, could change over time for the individual. And uh, what else they got here? Income can change over time. And then we've got last, fourth, trend variables. And trend variables will change, oh, uh, will change, but in a predictable way, like your age. We kind of know how much older you're going to be next year already, so um, it's going to change for you, but it's going to change in a way that we can absolutely predict uh, beforehand. All right, so that, those are the characteristics of panel data, and there are two main ways of estimating a regression with panel data. One's called a fixed effects model, and we're going to talk about that quite a bit, and one's called a, a random effects model, which we're going to talk about very little. All right, here we go. Fixed effects. And you've got a homework on this, too. Uh, 
this this is where I caught an error in the book I was I was working out all the homework myself uh, th there was an error in the key uh, and uh, what they said in the key uh, I said that's not right I've run it myself and I got something different and I, I, I of course doubted myself at first uh, and checked and double checked and then I emailed the author and he's like oh yeah now the author didn't do the key so I can't blame him for that uh, and obviously everyone's gonna make mistakes uh, let's see okay a fixed uh, let me write that up here a fixed effects model what fixed effects model this is very interesting. Um, what it does is it estimates the panel data by including enough dummy variables to allow each cross-sectional entity in each time period to have a different intercept. Uh, so you've got, let's see here, uh, whatever your variables are. Um, this is what you've estimated, but the intercept for, uh, let's say, Susie Johnson in 1960 is here, but the one for Bob Johnson in 1960 is up here, and the one for Susie Johnson in 1961 is somewhere else. So we're, we're getting the same slope coefficient, but we're assuming that the intercepts can be different. Uh, and so that's why we're including a dummy variable for each individual person if it's the grade thing, and uh, each individual time period. If we did 10 students over the course of, of, of 10 classes, we'd have uh, not 100 dummy variables. <clears throat> Remember, we always have one fewer than the total number of conditions. So we'd have nine plus nine, we'd have 18, all right? Uh, and you'll see that in one of the homeworks to figure that out. Now, let me show you here, uh, well, yeah, yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm not going to write all this out because it's going to take a minute and it's really just kind of tedious. Uh, look out, dog, you're stuck in the wire for the microphone. All right, so here's an example of a regression for a fixed effects model. Uh, X is the uh, regressor there, the variable we're really interested in. And then uh, to the right of that are all the fixed effects, some fixed by uh, the entity, for example, the individual student, and some fixed by time. So uh, the T sub, uh, a TF sub two there might be for 1960. Uh, the TF sub T might be for 1970, you know, and then in between all the other years, except one. Remember, you don't include a dummy variable for every year because the because one of them is the omitted condition that holds true when all the others are zeros. Yeah, you have to, if you have to go back and look at that one again, uh, do so. But, and then also, likewise, you have an individual, let me get the water here because he's moving. He hears the guy that's doing, giving the estimate. Um, and you have a, a individual a fixed effect in, in the, let's see, in the homework, it's years for the uh, time fixed effects, and it's different cities for the entity fix effects, all right? So that's what you would estimate, that big sucker right there. Now, they then uh, give a really interesting example. He says, okay, let's look at these data on a murder rate as a function of executions. Uh, the executions that had taken place over the previous three years, I believe. Uh, yeah, previous three years. So, uh, and he runs the regression. You've got all the data there. You can do it yourself. He runs the regression without doing the fixed effect stuff by just doing a cross section of all the data just for 1990. And he's got, trying to show here how uh, a fixed effects model can be very useful because it can pull out information that otherwise is hidden. He just did a cross section for just 1990. He actually has data for 1990 and 1993. But as an example, he just did 1990. And what he showed was that as executions take place, it increases the number of murders. All right? And remember, this, this is lagged over here, the executions. So it's not like, well, yeah, of course, they're going to move together because when there's a murder, that creates an execution. But the execution is lagged. It's for the previous three years. All right? uh, and so it should be, you know, his, his theory here is that the more executions there are, the fewer murders there are. He's getting a positive sign. Uh, and it's significant. So he says, but... Perhaps we should have used a fixed effects model. Perhaps what we should have done, and again, all these data are in the book and in one of the data files, so you can do it yourself. Um, but what he does is he, now, now think about this. Uh, he's got two years in 50 states. Um, he's going to have 49 dummy variables for states. 
one for Alabama, two, uh, uh, one for Arkansas, one for, uh, what's another state? Texas. Right. And then one of them's not going to have a, uh, yes, come on up. Uh, one of them's not going to have a dummy variable at all. In fact, actually, I believe in the study he said Alabama is the one they did uh, that, that, that was the omitted condition. And then, <clears throat> so they're going to have 49 of those for different states. And then there's going to be uh, one for year. He's got two years. But what did he use? I don't know if he used one for 1990 and oh it's in the book actually I don't remember but it doesn't really matter I don't care if we used one for 1990 and zero for 1993 or vice versa uh, but he had one time variable now I mentioned that specifically because <clears throat> when I show you this regression you're gonna be like wait a minute you had the number of executions as one of the independent variables you've got a dummy variable for time and then you've got 49 other dummy variables in this regression, I should be seeing 51 uh, coefficients here. And I'm only going to show you two. And the point is that we really weren't that concerned about the coefficients on Alabama, Arkansas, and so forth. We just needed the control for it. We just needed the control for those things. And by the way, I should have said this earlier, um, because we're working on the assumption that the individual cultures and laws uh, and uh, you know maybe there's more murders in big cities so you're not going to have a lot in Montana uh, at all uh, that there may be differences among states in what we should expect in terms of murders uh, and executions and also there may have been why are we doing 1990 and 1993 well maybe there were some national changes maybe the Supreme Court declared uh, um, executions uh, unconstitutional or maybe the Supreme Court said hey we should execute everybody you know so that would obviously make a difference over time so we're including all those but we really weren't interested in those in particular we were wondering do executions reduce murders everything else held constant and only by including all those dummy variables can we fulfill everything else held constant. Okay, so now, the exciting conclusion. Here is, I'm going to try to bring him with me over here. Um, here is the regression result when he did that as a fixed effects model. Now, uh, notice that equation 16.8, as I said, only has two independent variables there. He only included, he only showed the uh, executions one and the one for oh look it looks like 1993 was a one I guess uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that but it might have but he left out all of the state ones as being uninteresting and uh, notice now that the execution variable is negative just as we expected before once we held everything else constant and remember some states execute a whole lot of people all right we, we live in one um, and some don't so you know you need to take an individual account of what's going on in each state and again we can do this with the dummy variable so now that we have held all that constant now we find out hey it does have a negative and look at that t-score uh, 2.38 that's absolutely uh, certainly with 100 observations going to be significant uh, and then there was a change over time too and I don't know what he says about that uh, there were more executions over uh, uh, over time um, that the 1993 there were more executions uh, than in um, uh, 1990 all right so let's see and they are square notice uh, just are going way up um, and he says here about that that uh, uh, yeah because of all those dummy variables that are going to be taken into account what happened in each state that we have a much higher adjusted r square so that's the fixed effects model now uh, the random effects model I'm not gonna, I'm gonna say very little about because we're not going to do anything with that in homework and so forth but I just want you to know that it exists uh, the fixed effects model is based on the assumption that each one of those cross-sectional units had its own intercept remember I said that that um, there's a different intercept for Alabama than there is for Arkansas. And there's a different intercept for Alabama in 1990 than for Alabama in 1993. Well, what if instead you believe, no, I think pretty much all the intercepts are going to be about the same. Um, and uh, that they're just drawn from a distribution that's going to center around one intercept. Then you're going to use a random effects model, which means you don't have to include all those dummy variables anymore because you're assuming that, that there's going to be some similarities in the, in the intercepts. You get many more degrees of freedom because remember every time, if you do the random effects, because remember every time you add a new explanatory variable that reduces the degrees of freedom, and uh, see, estimates can be generated for variables that are constant over time. 
uh, random effects models. Uh, okay, yeah. That, that then goes through some issues as to uh, why you would pick one over the other. Um, basically, if you believe the intercepts would be different, you use the, the fixed effects. If you don't, you use the random effects. And Koble and I would like to say thank you for listening in to our fireside chats about econometrics. And that's it for the entire book. May the force be with you. Come on, buddy.